It is difficult to fathom that the people of Rome, just as people elsewhere in the world, are completely unaware that their own elected government, with the assistance of the United Nations, have since 1945 been poisoning their own people at chronic but sub-lethal levels to impair their fertility and achieve necessary demographic objectives in order to avoid wars of necessity over scarce natural resources. Yet that is exactly what has been happening without the people's consent or knowledge. Controlling population growth is a substitute to war. The rationale is sound and simple. If a country maintains its population at a stable level and thus neither grows nor decreases over time, it will be able to feed its people and will not have to resort to war to take by force the resources of weaker neighbors. And if every country on earth stabilizes its population equally, then peace can be maintained for all times across the world and we would never again have to experience the horrible destruction and chaos of war. In our days, we find it difficult to understand how the Romans drew pleasure from watching men fight to death, gladiators, right here in the Colosseum, for no apparent benefit other than the entertainment of the crowd. Yet, Roman society somehow found the sacrifice worthwhile. Since that time, we believe to have made moral and social progress and to behave more humanely towards our fellow human beings. But the reality is that the gladiatorial combat of Roman times pales by comparison in scale and scope, if not in cruelty, with the sacrifices imposed on us by modern society. The Romans reduced men to creatures marked out for slaughter in the arena, for the gratification of emperors and the mob. The international community of today has condemned humankind to slaughter in far gentler, yet equally deadly ways for the sake of managing the global population. The faithful have gathered in Rome from the four corners of the world to witness the canonization of two previous popes and to pay homage to an institution they trust and respect, the Roman Catholic Church. They represent every Christian denomination under the sun, but it is not their faith that is their single and most striking common denominator. What ties them all together is that they are all victims of the global depopulation policy, a covert and secret program of population control that seeks to reduce the global population to a sustainable level and employs chemical and biological agents to undermine human fertility, as well as a variety of psychosocial and economic methods to subvert the family. The methods used by every country to control population growth have been dictated by the level of development and the existing infrastructure, as much as by political will or lack thereof and have either been imposed by force and deception from the outside or adopted willingly by the governing elites of nation-states that have relied on the moral, technical and monetary assistance of the United Nations, its agencies and the greater international community. While China has used the one-child policy, thus open legislation, and India has employed covert surgical sterilization, the West has resorted to covert chemical sterilization. Fluoridation is the West's method of choice for suppressing fertility in both men and women. It has been used throughout the West since 1950, and fluoride is delivered either through tap water, table salt, or milk, depending on the country and its level of development. A few select and wealthy nations in Northern Europe use compulsory dental plans to ensure that every citizen receives periodic applications of fluoride directly in the mouth. Regardless of the delivery agent used, fluoridation has been imposed on the populace under the pretext that it combats tooth decay, which is completely inaccurate and dishonest. Of the four methods, water fluoridation is by far the most widespread, as it is used on nearly one billion people the world over. 
Water fluoridation, however, is only possible in places with a modern infrastructure of water treatment plants. And therefore, even in wealthy nations, it is only viable in cities that have at least 10,000 people. Salt fluoridation is the second most popular fluoridation method and is in use throughout Latin America and the Caribbean region, as well as in a few European countries that have abandoned water fluoridation. Milk fluoridation is restricted to very few countries and is used as a supplementary method of fluoridation elsewhere. To keep human beings in a constant state of fluoride poisoning, toothpaste and dental health products throughout the world are fluoridated. To close the loophole created by the modern habit of drinking bottled rather than tap water, the depopulation lobby has replaced glass with plastic bottling starting in 1980 and has used a specific fertility depressing chemical called bisphenol A, BPA for short, to manufacture two kinds of plastics, polycarbonates and epoxy resins. BPA is ingested when it leaches into food and beverages for human consumption. Since nearly every plastic bottle on the planet is now made of BPA-based polycarbonates, and almost every metal and aluminum can in the world is lined with epoxy resins containing BPA, people are chronically exposed. The lining of metal cans with BPA is aimed at both the urban and rural poor who are more likely to eat canned soups, vegetables and fruit and will thus receive more than their share of fertility depressing agents as they will ingest it from multiple sources. But as the depopulation lobby has a strong eugenic component to it, reducing the numbers of the poor is a desirable outcome. Spraying powdered aluminum oxide at high altitudes by airplane a phenomenon known as chemtrails, is a rather new method of population control that is restricted to NATO countries and is aimed at breaking the back of organic and traditional farmers to make room for corporations and their genetically modified crops. The aluminum sprayed falls to the ground and poisons the soil and the water, which has two intended consequences. First, it makes the growing of traditional or heirloom seeds impossible and forces farmers into bankruptcy thus freeing the land for purchase by agro-giants who stand ready with aluminum-resistant genetically modified seeds. And secondly, aluminum binds with fluoride compounds and greatly increases fluoride toxicity, therefore reducing the human body's toxicity threshold level previously thought safe. In other words, you can do far more damage to human health with aluminum fluoride than you can do with just fluoride and you need less of it. That is why, for example, the spraying of aerosolized aluminum is far more prevalent on the western seaboard of Canada and the US where tap water fluoridation is scarce and people ingest fluoride from bottled water and soft drinks as well as canned foods but at lower levels than people whose tap water is fluoridated. Poor countries do not have water treatment plants and therefore cannot fluoridate their tap water. Salt fluoridation requires the political will and stability necessary to co-opt a select few politicians and bureaucrats. But Africa's political landscape is volatile and forever changing. And milk fluoridation is expensive and morally reprehensible as it targets innocent children through free milk school programs and sickens them when they're young and defenseless. African leaders, moreover, have largely resisted international pressure to poison their people. That is why the depopulation lobby has devised effective methods of population control for Africa specifically, and more recently for other poor and reluctant countries whose voluntary cooperation was impossible to gain. If the depopulation lobby could not control the number of people born into the world, then they would increase the number of people leaving this world. In other words, if they could not tackle the population problem at the front end of life by controlling fertility, they would and did tackle it at the back end of life by increasing morbidity and mortality. This was deemed necessary for Africa, which resisted any and all attempts at population control. The HIV AIDS virus was specifically created for the sub-Saharan African population by a cooperative effort between Soviet and American scientists 
in the employ of their nation's military-industrial complexes. It was designed to do maximum damage by undermining the immune system and to have an affinity for people of color. It gradually achieved its intended goal once it was introduced into the bloodstreams of countless innocents in Africa, Brazil, and Haiti by the World Health Organization through its smallpox immunization program that ended in 1980. Infection is as high as 30% in some African nations. And 70% of all AIDS deaths occur in Africa. More than 1 million people die in Africa from AIDS annually, and nearly 2 million new infections are registered every year. Bioengineered flu strains such as N1H1, the swine flu, and the bird flu viruses have been used to manufacture mass fear of pandemics and condition the public to the practice of mandatory vaccines or government-mandated vaccinations programs. This will allow the authorities to target specific populations when and if the eugenicists decide that a new deadly strain must be introduced into an unyielding population, as it was done in Africa, Haiti and Brazil until 1980. Genetically modified organisms are the newest and most sophisticated weapon in the eugenic arsenal and are intended for the developing world where chemical population control methods cannot be applied due to poor infrastructure. Primary GMO crops are corn, canola, cotton and soybean. Fierce resistance to GMO crops has, however, put into doubt their viability as a global fertility depressing agent. Their advantage, however, lies in the fact that the people targeted will be growing their own poison and paying for it, which makes GMOs ideal for poor nations whose governments cannot afford to pay for population control of any kind, be it chemical, biological, or bacteriological. Their advantage lies also in the fact that they can be engineered to do as little or as much damage as is desirable, and no one will be any wiser for it. Ever since the United Nations assumed primary control and responsibility over the global depopulation policy in the early 1960s, it has been looking for more humane ways to achieve the intended demographic objectives and has concentrated much of its effort and resources on finding psychosocial ways to change the dynamic of family life and to put enough pressure on families and individuals to make it difficult and undesirable to have more than one child. Various countries have encouraged various forms of substance abuse to detract individuals from family life and to cause the dissolution of mostly low-income families by premature death, chronic illness or crippling debt. The West has promoted the use of recreational drugs. China has encouraged excessive tobacco use. And Russia has made alcohol sufficiently cheap and ubiquitous to create a nation of alcoholics. As a result, drug addiction has reached epidemic proportions in many Western countries, and particularly in the US and Canada, where tens of thousands of families are destroyed by drug addiction annually. Smoking deaths have tripled in China over the course of the past decade, and tobacco has become the number one killer, causing 1.2 million deaths a year. By 2030, the number of tobacco-related deaths is expected to reach 3.5 million a year. And it is forecast that if trends continue, a third of all males in China will be killed by tobacco by 2050. Even more disastrous is Russia's alcohol problem. Alcohol consumption has nearly tripled over the past 16 years, and more than half a million Russians die of alcohol-related deaths annually. In no small part, due to alcohol abuse, the life expectancy of Russian males has dropped to 59 years, 17 years lower than their male counterparts in Western Europe. These patterns of substance abuse have dire effects on family formation and family size. The counterculture of the 1960s, which brought about the sexual revolution, was encouraged in order to break the sexual taboos that prevented the mainstream from adopting widespread and uninhibited contraceptive use. It also made drug use socially acceptable and set the stage 
for the introduction of ever more destructive drugs, both legal and illegal, creating a drug market and an underground economy that relies on drugs and prostitution, is antithetical to families and has become a breeding ground for HIV AIDS. The hippie counterculture of the 1960s was followed by the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender, the LGBT counterculture of the 1970s and 1980s, which brought about acceptance for and decriminalization of homosexuality in time for the explosion of LGBT caused by the effects of long-term exposure to fluoride, which raises the incidence of sexual confusion from a naturally occurring level of about 4% to an artificially high level of 15%. The most subtle and insidious form of population control is the manipulation of the law to criminalize formerly acceptable social behaviors and domestic quarrels and to incarcerate a large percentage of the poor in order to prevent them from forming families and raising children. Throughout the Western world, and especially in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, this form of population control fulfills the eugenic requirements of the policy as it targets primarily minorities and the poor. The zero tolerance domestic law, minor drug offenses, and the three strikes law are typical examples of legislation designed to fulfill the requirements of the global depopulation policy. The zero tolerance domestic law is designed to break families apart at the slightest conflict by removing discretionary powers from the police and giving the state the authority to go over the wishes of spouses to press criminal charges that result in bankruptcy and family dissolution. Conflicts that could be resolved in the privacy of homes within minutes or days are given the status of violent crime to destroy families, separate parents from children, and to transfer their wealth to the judicial class. The Three Strikes Law mandates harsh sentences for anyone who has been convicted of two felonies and who upon being convicted of a third felony faces life in prison. It was first applied in Washington State in 1993 and then in California in 1994 to compensate for their lack of fluoridation due to popular opposition and then spread throughout the western seaboard for the same reason. As a result of such eugenic laws, hundreds of thousands of families are broken apart annually in the English-speaking world as well as in several European countries. In the US, the judiciary has become the primary tool for eugenic objectives, giving America the dubious distinction of being the nation with the highest incarceration rate in the world and also in history at 743 adults behind bars for every 100,000 citizens. When people on correctional supervision and on house arrest are factored in, the US far surpasses even Stalinist Russia in the number and proportion of prisoners to the general population. Statistics also show that visible minorities bear the brunt of the incarceration mania that has gripped the United States and to a lesser extent much of the Western world. Canada ravages its native population by this method. Europe's statistics, as well as Australia's, are skewed by the fact that immigrants are held in separate detention centers and are not counted as imprisoned. Economic pressures are also used to create an environment that is hostile to families and especially to the raising of children. The United Nations' favorite method for reducing the number of children is women's participation in the workforce. In the name of poverty eradication, women's education and employment have been given the highest priority. To this end, women in the developing world are being encouraged to get educated and forced to leave their traditional place at home to seek employment. A working woman has less time for children and therefore less incentive to have children. A working woman will also delay childbearing to satisfy career ambitions or the demands of the labor market. But since women make up 51% of the global population, the steady influx of women into the labor market depresses wages worldwide at a time when unemployment is already a chronic problem the world over. This mass migration of women into the workforce is also displacing men economically, disrupting traditional patterns of life, 
confusing gender roles, and pitting men against women, all of which aid the cause of achieving smaller and fewer families. The demand for excessive and unnecessary credentials is the means by which entrance into the workforce is delayed in the developing world, so as to prevent young people from starting families early in life when their biological clocks make them most fertile. The average age for women to have children in Europe and Japan is 29, while in the US it is 25. Throughout the developed world, women today have their children at least four years later than women in 1970. In the first half of the 20th century, when the population was not subjected to social engineering, European women had their children in their late teens and early 20s. By delaying entrance into the workforce, both men and women an entire decade has been shaved off from women's childbearing years. The media is being used to condition people to be rabid consumers and to dedicate their incomes to excessive materialism rather than invested in children as previous generations did. The consumption of goods and services in ever greater amounts has become man's primary preoccupation in the socially engineered post-World War II era giving rise to a consumer society that is self-centered and has relegated children to secondary status. Foreign aid followed by World Bank loans and then by IMF austerity programs have intentionally created spiraling debt in the developing world to deprive poor nations of the revenue needed to invest in infrastructure and social programs. Coupled with plummeting commodity prices and Western protectionism, this has become the formula for poverty that the developed world has imposed on the developing world to create economic conditions that are hostile to families. Monetary coercion has replaced military conquest to control the resources and destinies of other nations. This is done to halt the population explosion that prevents the developing world from catching up with the needs of its growing population as much as it is done for the rich world's self-serving need to secure access to vital resources on foreign soil. This catch-22 situation is the cycle of poverty that the architects of the global depopulation policy hope to break worldwide by instituting tough medicine now on nations that are late newcomers to population control measures. The population control lobby is rightfully concerned that 90% of the people born in the past 50 years in the world were born in the developing world, thus in countries that were already poor and could least afford unrestricted population growth. How can the church claim moral authority over Christendom, while at the same time keep secret its knowledge of the world's greatest genocide? How could Pope after Pope, since the early 1950s, appear before their adoring worshippers to bless them and guide them through life, while knowing that each and every one of them is being slowly poisoned into extinction, and in the process, irreparable harm is done to their health and well-being? These are questions that we'll hopefully be able to answer over the next few days here in Rome. For the time being, I want to say this to Pope Francis. There can be no church without people. There can be no humanity without compassion. There can be no trust without honesty. And there can be no faith without truth. Speak the truth, Pope Francis, and deliver us from evil. You have the ability. Use it. You have our trust. Honor it. Otherwise, Christ will have died in vain.